Sorry, bro. No big whoop, dog. Yo, did you catch that new vid on the box? True that. I'm up to stiz off on all popular trends. Word. So, I've been in a bit of a Scooby-Doo mood in the past few weeks since, uh, you know. I thought lesbians were good at solving crimes. It's like the one positive stereotype perpetuated by cop shows. I've been watching the original show, a bit of what's new, a few of those direct-to-video bangers from the late 90s and early 2000s, and then I got to the live-action movie, a film that I haven't seen in probably like 15 years, maybe more, and I often confuse with the sequel, Monsters Unleashed. So when I put that sucker in, I didn't know what to expect. It was like watching it for the first time. And I gotta say, it goes so hard. And I am not being ironic. It is a genuinely great, entertaining, funny, quality adaptation of Scooby-Doo. I mean, it's not like Citizen Kane or anything, but it's pretty damn good. And as I usually do after I see a movie, I was perusing the internet looking for little fun facts and such. And I saw that this movie has just the worst reviews. Like, not just the usual this is bad kind of stuff. I'm talking like people really hating this movie. It's not even one of those movies on Rotten Tomatoes that has horrible critic scores but great audience scores. It is deep in the garbage on both fronts. Even Agent Cody Banks has a higher score than this. We've spent 10 million dollars training this kid, and we did not teach him how to talk to a girl! So now, in spite of the internet, I am going to make a video on why everyone is wrong about this movie. And not just because I'm a deeply insecure contrarian that can't handle people even having the slightest different opinions than me. While that is true, I really do think that the people that dog on this movie so much miss the mark, and I want to explain why. Because this movie just deserves better. One of the more interesting things about this movie is all the hoops it had to go through to even get made in the first place. The sheer amount of production hell and insane ideas that were floated in early stages of this movie could be a whole video on its own. For like the entire 90s, the film was in development hell going through all kinds of incarnations that just sound terrible. Jim Carrey was attached to play Shaggy at one point, Jennifer Aniston was considered to play Daphne, Kevin Smith of all people was set to direct until he dropped out and they brought on Mike Myers? And eventually all of that was scrapped until the film as we know it today was conceived. But even then there were some strange ideas. The film was originally going to be a darker PG-13 where Shaggy was a stoner, Thelma and Daphne had a relationship, and there were open references to marijuana. James Gunn, who if you didn't already know, wrote the movie, said a few years ago that the original cut was rated R and they had to use CGI to cover cleavage. Which considering how much cleavage is in the final cut of the film, I really want to know what they had to cut out. There was also an idea to have the opening of the film be 100% cartoon, all kinds of stuff like that. I could go on. So while the final version of the film is still wacky and out there, the fact that it came off as normal as it did is a minor miracle, especially when you consider that this movie was going to get made one way or another at some point. Once Hollywood got the idea of a live action Scooby-Doo in their heads, it was only a matter of time. We just got lucky that the right people ended up making it at the right time. We may be living in the darkest timeline in some areas of life, but at least we don't live in the one where Jim Carrey is Shaggy and Chris Farley is Shrek. Now, if that means the world has to succumb to a nuclear apocalypse, I think it's a fair trade. But anyway, let's talk about the actual movie. I think the most important thing when approaching a live action version of a cartoon or an adaptation of a video game or a comic or anything like that is the intentions of the people making it. Since usually these types of projects are adapted by people who had nothing to do with the original work, they are oftentimes not aware of what made it good in the first place and don't have that same level of personal investment. That's not to say that it can't be done well without the original creator, but it's certainly more of a coin flip. 
I mean, we don't even have to leave this franchise to find an example of this. So, while the phrase hire fans is one of the dumbest, most asinine things people on the internet say, it does have a slight grain of truth to it. You want to hire not fans, but people who understand and respect the IP they are adapting. Because if you don't, then you run the risk of not only making a bad film, but alienating the fans that should be on your side by default. So easily the highest praise I can give this film is that everyone from the director to the writer to the cast and every level of production genuinely cares and understands the Scooby-Doo franchise. Every time they went into a new environment, there was a whole color, like one room would be completely green, the next room would be completely blue, blue castles. There were always, it was always blue in there, I don't know why, but if you notice, our castle interior is blue. It has a level of unapologetic wholesomeness that really isn't seen in movies anymore. Unlike the Marvel films that are often embarrassed to even say the name of one of their heroes because it's quote unquote too silly, the people making Scooby-Doo knew exactly what they were making and they're not ashamed of it. Yes, it's silly, but they actually use the inherent silliness of the franchise as a strength by leaning into all of those aspects, which gives the movie such a unique charm. They all wear their classic outfits, they drive the mystery machine, which looks exactly like it does in the cartoon, the scenarios and villains they face dip into the realm of fantasy instead of trying to be realistic, the characters are all hyper-exaggerations of their cartoon variants. It's like a cartoon come to life. In short, the film embraces everything about Scooby-Doo that people love and dials it to 11. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel. We already have the wheel. It's great. It's just taking that wheel and putting a jet engine on it. So let's get a little more specific and break down the movie piece by piece. So the movie opens up right in the middle of the gang solving one of their usual mysteries. Everyone is running around doing their thing. Daphne is captured, Velma and Fred are working on a plan, and Shaggy and Scooby are just doing what they always do best. And as they always do, they eventually catch the bad guy and solve the mystery. It's familiar, concise, and establishes the world in a very effective way. Now, this is nothing revolutionary, but it's a much better idea than doing the obvious origin story. It would have been so easy for James Gunn to just make the whole movie about the gang first coming together. You know, something stupid, like having the whole thing set in high school and never actually solving any crimes. But we don't need any of that. Everyone knows Scooby-Doo and what every character in it is about. There is no need to ever tell their origin. Instead, the movie is about them coming back together after years apart. Which, as I was watching it, something in my brain lit up. As if I had seen this exact thing before. And, as it turns out, I had. The intro of this movie is exactly the same as Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. It's so similar, in fact, that there is no way James Gunn didn't take any inspiration from it. They both open up at the end of a mystery. Then the gang goes their separate ways, we see how they live their lives post Mystery Inc, and then they finally reunite to go to a mysterious island. So while yes, not very original, I do think it was a smart move to just copy Zombie Island. After all, that movie is what reignited the franchise for my generation and paved the way for What's New Scooby-Doo and a bunch of great direct-to-video movies like The Witch's Ghost and Cyber Chase. It also shows that James Gunn has a real understanding of what works in the franchise. He saw the blueprint that Zombie Island established and just went with it. I can only criticize him so much for aping off arguably the best Scooby-Doo movie ever made, especially since everything that comes after the intro is totally his own. Now, Gunn's script does provide a great foundation for the movie, but what really sells it is the main cast. With the exception of Scooby-Doo, who I would have preferred to have been voiced by either Frank Welker or Scott Innes, the other four main characters are casted perfectly. They brought on Freddie Prince Jr. and Sarah Michelle Gellar to play Fred and Daphne in part because they were already a couple in real life and had that built-in chemistry. 
Similar with Matthew Lillard, who also had a previous connection with Freddie Prince Jr. from previous films. Then you throw in Linda Cardellini, who is just great in everything, and you have this match made in heaven. The four of them work so well together, you would think they had been doing these roles together for years. You may think that this is a crazy thing to say, but despite the outwardly silliness of the characters, I think they do a genuinely better and more impressive job of acting than many serious dramatic actors that people fawn over. Audiences, and especially critics, rarely if ever give credit to performances like this, but they are just as challenging as any other role. Sure, they aren't crying or giving long monologues, but they are doing a tremendous amount of physical acting. All of them capture that over-the-top cartoon zaniness needed for the role. They are meant to stick out as these walk-in embodiments of cartoon characters in real life. And they do, but not so much that it's annoying. They ride that line perfectly of being just a little weirder and more eccentric than the average person, but not so dialed up that it comes off distracting. And all of that is because much like James Gunn and Raja Gosnell and everyone else in the movie, they know exactly what they are making. Everyone is on the same page. That is, except for one man who rises above the others and genuinely delivers a great performance. Matthew Lillard as Shaggy. There is no flaw to speak of. He nails the voice, the mannerisms, everything. He is Casey Kasem's Shaggy come to life. But he's not just doing an impression of him. He's taking that foundation and making it his own. And unlike the rest of the cast, most of his scenes are just him acting opposite Scooby-Doo, who from his point of view in some scenes is either a disembodied head or a green demon monster. He has the hardest job in the movie by a mile and just nails it. Aside from the dated CGI, the interactions with him and Scooby are totally seamless and it's entirely due to his excellent performance. He straight up carries this movie. Every time you turn around, there are kids on the set. And you see them staring at you wide-eyed because you're shaggy. You ask a random kid, I look like Tom Selleck. I look like, you know, Tom Cruise. I look like Shaggy. This may be my hottest take ever, but Matthew Lillard as Shaggy in this movie gives a legitimately better performance than Leonardo DiCaprio's Academy Award winning performance in The Revenant. Now, I'm not trying to say that he should have been nominated for an Oscar for this movie or anything. I'm not going that far. That take really says more about Leo than it does about Lillard. But the point is, he is excellent in the film. All four of them are. Not only do they perfectly embody these characters, but they seem to actively love playing them. None of them have the attitude that they are too good for this type of movie and are embarrassed by being in it like George Clooney and Batman. They have real love for these characters, silly as they may be. That's why I say it is perfectly casted. Because it's not just about getting good actors. It's about getting good actors that A. want to be there, B. have chemistry, and C. most importantly, understand the role they have been given. Yes, Jim Carrey is generally a better actor than Matthew Lillard, but that doesn't mean he would be as good as Lillard in this specific role. Sometimes acting isn't all about acting. So between Gunn's script and the main cast performances, the film has this almost unexplainable wholesomeness that permeates everything in it. Even some things that otherwise would have come off completely dated and cringy by today's standards, when put through the whimsical, genuine, soulful lens of this film, seem so innocent and charming. It's like anti-cringe. Because believe you me, some of the early 2000s shenanigans present in this movie, in the hands of lesser people, would have come off so bad. Most notably, how horny this film is which is what the movie is probably most known for. This is most likely left over from the original R cut of the film, but even with that in mind, the movie is exceptionally horny. Daphne is always showing cleavage, and she makes O oh noises repeatedly throughout the film. Oh, this ghost keeps grabbing- ah! 
Isla Fisher shows up just to be a bimbo. Even Velma, who is traditionally not portrayed as a hot lady, is played by Linda Cardellini and they take full advantage. Now as I said, in a lesser film, this would have all come off as extremely creepy and uncomfortable, but the movie just has a way of taking that element out. Even though all the women in the movie are all sexed up, no one feels exploited like they do in some of the movies that came out around that time. I mean, Isla Fisher's character only exists to give Shaggy a hot babe to smooch on, but even that somehow comes off kind of wholesome. The movie has all the cringy 2000s stuff like the hot babes everywhere, and the terrible licensed music, and the overacting, and the wacky sets and costumes and the unnecessary celebrity cameos, and a plot that makes less than no sense, but manages to turn all of those things into a charming feature rather than a detriment. It is the only movie I have ever seen that is both completely of its time and dated, but somehow also timeless. It's like a glitch in the Matrix. This movie stands in utter spite of common sense and logic in all the best ways possible. Bottom line, it just has good vibes. But the movie isn't good just because of abstract things like that. It's also just generally well made. Take the sets for example. There are so few films that really go above and beyond with their set design, and when they do, they are rarely if ever praised for it. And this film is no different. For one, all of them are real constructed sets and not CGI, which I will always be favorable towards. Even if a blue or green screen set looks good, there is still that uncanny valley effect that will always stick out. So when a movie takes time to make a real set to shoot on, it always turns out better. The Haunted Castle and The Toy Factory especially stand out in this. They are both chocked full of detail and color and cool moving parts. It not only looks great, but it also gives it that live action cartoon feel that you want to have in a project like this. Even the on-location places they filmed are spiced up to have that slightly cartoony feel. They make the actual mystery machine and don't try to like update it or make it look cool. It's all as it should be. There are also some really great stunts in the movie that I will add were all done by the real actors, which just further reinforces how much they care about the movie. Everyone on set is giving it their all every day. And they have to because, let's be honest, the CG parts of this movie, they're just not very good. There I said it. There is but a single flaw in this movie. Scooby-Doo is actually done pretty well and is really only dated by today's standards, but the CGI monsters in the film, yeah, those just suck. I know they wanted to have real monsters be the twist, but you can still have a real monster that is played by a guy in a costume. But again, I can only get so critical because they make up for the poor CGI by having such great stunt work and creative sets and these really awesome fun sequences. The main plot is more or less like any episode of the original show. The gang arrives at a place, they split up and look for clues, a few chase sequences and moments of revelation occur, and then we get to the ending, which in this movie goes absolutely balls to the wall. Instead of the main villain being some evil white guy trying to lower the property value of a theme park by scaring people while dressed as a vampire, the main villain in this is literally trying to conquer the world as we know it. Not only that, but it's Scrappy-Doo of all people. Gee, Scraps, no reason to freak out like a jerk and try to kill all humanity. <laughs> Now usually I'm a fan of more subdued endings in movies, but if you are going to do the big crazy ending, at least go as crazy as possible. And this movie is the textbook example of that. I love it so much. Mainly because while it is clever to have Scrappy-Doo as the bad guy, the reason why he is the bad guy seems to have less to do with wanting to do something original or clever and more to do with James Gunn's utter disdain for Scrappy-Doo's very existence. His quotes on Scrappy-Doo are some of the funniest things you will ever hear a screenwriter say about a character they themselves are writing. 
even more so because he appears to be 100% serious, there is perhaps no person on earth who holds as much animosity for anything as James Gunn does for Scrappy-Doo, and he just so happened to get a job making a Scooby-Doo movie. And he really does do him as dirty as possible. His one and only scene as a member of the gang features him peeing on Daphne to mark her as his territory and then attempting to usurp command of the gang from Fred via a coup at which point they abandon him on the side of the road in what appears to be the middle of a desert. You really can't make this stuff up. But it works. Everything he does is so insane that you just gotta love it. He first presumably walks out of the desert, gets a job at Spooky Island, kidnaps Mr. Bean, creates a perfect robotic suit copy of Mr. Bean for him to pilot, takes over operations of the island, finds a way to extract the souls of humans via some kind of dark magic, invites the gang there so he can steal the pure soul of his uncle Scooby so that he can walk the earth as a demon puppy and crush everyone with his superior puppy power. The stakes have truly never been higher, but just like they always do, the gang comes through at the end, the day is saved, everyone gets a smooch, and they all live happily ever after. Also, on a very basic level, the movie is genuinely funny. There are some fun jabs at some Scooby-Doo tropes, like when they all split up and Fred always wants to go with Daphne, which is funny, but my favorite jokes are the ones where you just have normal everyday people reacting to these weirdo college kids who dress like it's 1969 and just have no regard for their own safety. Like where Daphne is interrogating some random guy on the beach and he is just dumbfounded as to why she wants to go into this spooky castle so badly. But easily the best joke in the movie, nay, the best joke in any movie ever, is of course the legendary Melvin Dew joke. A joke that is both as stupid as it is genius. A joke that makes young screenwriters give up their ambitions because they know they will never be able to craft such a masterpiece of comedy. We got a Mr. Do here. I got a call for a Mr. Do. Uh, Melvin Do? Nah, Scooby. Hmm? Who I need to complete my transformation is Scooby Do! <laughs> Wait, you mean Melvin do? So yeah, I think this movie is great, and I'm not afraid to say it, but getting back to what I said earlier about the critical response to this movie, I must say, I was shocked with how negative some of the reviews are. Like, it is totally okay to not like this movie, but man, I saw some of the most vitriolic reviews I have ever read. A sentiment that I didn't expect to find was that so many critics hated not only the movie itself, but the Scooby-Doo franchise in general. The sheer level of hatred for anything remotely silly and fun seemed to be a pretty common theme with critics at the time. Some hating the costumes, others calling the original series wretched. One even went so far as to credit the original Scooby-Doo creators William Hanna and Joseph Barbera as doing more to destroy the art of animation than any two men who have ever lived. Now again, for the hundredth time, it is perfectly okay not to like Scooby-Doo, but what bothers me about the way a lot of critics judge media is how restrictive their lens is. Not all, but many critics seem to judge every movie on the same scale and think that the very idea of doing a silly movie like this is inherently bad. It's the classic Academy mindset where the only valid movies are dramas and the only valid performances are ones in which a person is disabled or cries a lot or has to eat a raw fish or something stupid like that. That mindset is such a plague on the film industry, not only because they constantly put down other genres like animation for having the gall to even exist, but also because what really separates a dramatic film from a movie like this? 
Nothing. At the end of the day, they are all doing the same job. Sure, they might be trying to capture different audiences, but that doesn't make what they are doing any less valid or prestigious. I'm not trying to say that I have all the answers when it comes to film criticism, but I just try to keep my mind open to any movie I see, no matter what they are trying to accomplish. The Scooby-Doo movie does everything well it sets out to do, and it's clear that the people making it genuinely cared about it. Which, if you think that is the case for all of these movies that have garnered Oscar nominations over the years, you're just wrong. It has inspiration and heart and effort, and for all of those reasons and many more, I consider it a classic. It's not perfect, but it's about as good as a live-action Scooby-Doo movie can be. What more do you want?